a quote more. <laughs> All right, it's recording. <laughs> so welcome again. My name is Jean, and I'm so, so excited to have um, the editors, um, Andrea Abby Crum and Kate Gabriel, to this incredible um, new anthology that's out from Night Boat. And we will stick a link in the chat so that you can buy this book directly from them or from your local independent bookstore. The um, program for today is a little bit different than some of the other readings that have happened and Andrew and Kay will talk about that, but because we're um, housed, we're kind of organizing this with the One Archives, which for those of you who don't know is the largest and oldest repository of LGBT archival materials in the world. Um, we really wanted to extend this moment to think about trans archival practices, the precarity of their histories, the ethical stakes of historical recovery, what it means to um, do this work to think about the categorization of trans histories, experiences, and movements um, within historical canons and collections that often erase them. And so to kind of think through these social and political constraints, we're going to be sharing some documentation, literature, film, photography, and ephemera with you alongside um, readings from contributors to the book who are no longer with us. Um, Bryn Kelly, Leslie Feinberg, uh, Lou Sullivan, and Sylvia Rivera. And I'm so excited to um, have a set of um, editors, authors, poets, artists, and filmmakers here with us today to do that work. And so I first just wanna um, introduce Andrea and Kay to share a little bit about this incredible anthology that they have assembled. Um, and Kate Gabriel is a writer, teacher, and organizer. She lives in Queens, New York. And Andrea Abikram is an Arab American punk poet, performer, cyborg, Leo, currently obsessed with queer terror and convertibles. Interesting. I'd like to know more. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Andrea and Kate. Hi, thanks, Jean, so much. Um, uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Uh, to, to, to you, thank you to the One Archives, thank you to everyone who's going to present tonight. Um, yeah, um, Andrea, what do we want to say? Um, yes, yeah, thank you, Jean, and thank you everyone for coming and to all the presenters. Um, when we were thinking about putting together this anthology from the beginning, we pretty much knew that we wanted to include um, work from estates and our beloved ancestors who are no longer with us and some friends who are no longer with us. And so this event feels really special to be able to um, enliven everyone's work. And we're gonna see some photos and some footage and some handwriting. And I'm just really excited. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, just just fleshing out that that historical picture a little bit, you know. So, so, I mean, we had a number of motivations for putting the book together, and uh, you can find those if you sort of read the introductory essay, which is in the book itself. It's also online. It was published independently on on LitHub, um, uh, and so we can talk about that, especially maybe at the end um, uh, once we we've started to hear from you know, once we've gone through the, the presenters. But to talk specifically about the archival pieces, one thing that was very important to us is linking this current moment of trans radicalism together with prior moments of the same. So kind of deepening our historical sense of, of, of what's going on, uh, um, understanding that we are, are linked in this pretty long history um, uh, and, and, and kind of using that to enlarge our sense of of, of radicalism, of struggle, um, and also of, of, of how poetry presents a way to think about those things. Um, yeah. And also knowing full well that um, language like adapts and shifts and mutates and a lot of the poetics that we're interested in um, investigate that and seeing works that are talking about similar moments of struggle and revolution and uprising and resistance being spoken about in different ways using different terminologies is also like an important piece of this kind of like historical linkage. Yeah, I mean, I think that's everything that I wanted to say by way of an introduction. Um, so I don't know, I mean, unless Andrea has anything further, maybe Jean, we can start introducing folks. Yeah, let's do it. We've got a full program, so let's do it. Okay, so um, as Kay mentioned, there's gonna be a little time at the end of this, um, this reading for folks to put questions in the chat or have a little bit of a conversation. So think about if you'd like to do that. And we are going to start with our um, first set of readings um, from 
Lou Sullivan. And so Joan can queue up. And our readers are going to be Alice Martin and Zach Ozma, who are the co-editors of the Lou Sullivan Diaries. Um, let me get it. <laughs> show you this beautiful book. Um, Ellis Martin works on the inner seas of art and archives and Zach Ozma is a social practice artist, um, sculptor, interdisciplinary artist, and Zach and Ellis take it away. Hi, thank you so much for having us. Um, thank you Kay and Andrea for this beautiful, beautiful collection. Um, so happy that Lou is, is in it along with so many other Absolutely amazing voices. Um, we have a short section and we also to share with you, um, Zach and I are gonna alternate reading and then we have some photos. Um, the first image that you'll see is his first diary ever. Um, and we will go through some more moments in the diaries and photos of Lou throughout his life. Um, so thanks for being here. My God, when he stands so near me, I feel like I'm gonna be burned as if he brushes against me. I can hardly hold myself back from taking hold of him. He looks like he tastes good. He smells good. I said I was very complimented he came over. He said he's real lonely lately. I debated with myself whether to give him Swinburne's Fragoletta, but decided against it at this time. No need to rush anything. We're having a 4th of July cookout on the roof. I just told him I got into a real poetry reading mood after everyone left from the party. We drank tea and talked. He sees me watching him and pretend he does, pretends he doesn't. And then he decides to give in and looks me right in the eye and laughs. Why is he always teasing me? Will I ever be able to kiss him? I wonder if this isn't all fantasy land or after some point he'll actually let me give him some of the physical pleasures he's craving so bad, but once from a tr true blue female. Uh, those 20 year old hormones. Fragoletta, too gushing, too physical. I instead found a leave taking by Swinburne. So I did it. I gave him the poem. He immediately opened it in front of everyone and asked me, what does this mean for you? I answered, it's a love poem. He began reading it and asked what it meant. I said, it says it all there better than I could say it. He said, then you're putting yourself down. I said, don't read it here. He said, I want to talk with you about this at your place. I was so shocked and nervous. I said, what? He repeated it. Come hence, let be, lie still. It is enough. He asked who wrote it. I said a turn of the century English poet. Suddenly, we were alone in the room. And I said, what did you want to talk about? He's sitting in an easy chair. I'm standing. He says, what do you feel inside for me? I answered, I think I love you. He asked why. I thought a second, recovering from his question. So blatant, so cutting, so disbelieving. I said, because I think about you a lot during the day. A smile came over his lips. He smiled at me and said, that's nice, thank you. I suggested we all go to a movie and he wanted to go get a sweater, I guess. So was going to meet us at the theater. I asked, can I come with you, T? He called back, sure, Lou, if you want to. We went to his beautiful, beautiful place. It was like Albion, but more beautiful. He said he built all the wood himself, a loft where he slept. I was enthralled, mystified. He lived there three years with a 30-year-old roommate. Suddenly, we were sitting on the floor and talking about some shit, and we lost track of the conversation, and I was gazing into his face, and he asked, what are you thinking about right now? I started laughing fell back on my elbows and answered, I was thinking about how beautiful you are. He told me that from the start, he felt something special between us too, and that he liked me a lot and thought we really had something good between us, that he felt really good that I told him how I felt. 
He said he didn't want to get into anything sexual with me, though. And I said, neither do I. That's what the poem says. We ran together to the movie. I didn't arrange to sit next to him, but there he sat next to me. If I follow my heart, I'm going to love you. He fucking let me kiss him in front of a big group of people, including Kuka. I said, look at this guy. He's an insatiable flirt. Have you no shame? He has no shame and I have no scruples. He told me he was completely complimented by my attentions. I said, you should be because you really did turn my head. Oh, sweet brat boy, belly word on my bed. And when the evening was ending, he said Kuka was jealous of me. I asked if she had said something. He said, no, but he can just tell. I asked what she was jealous about. And he said, she's afraid you're gonna turn me gay or something. He keeps wearing the same shirt, but it always looks fresh on him somehow. In certain moments, his hair, it looks like it could use a shampooing. Thou hast a serpent in thine hair. I asked if he read the poem and liked it. He hedged around, wouldn't be direct. I asked, did you read it? He blurted out, yes, three times. And did you like it? Yes, he shouted, his eyes flashing proudly. It seemed like every time he was on his way out, I was on my way in and we bump into each other in the corridor. In the beginning of the evening, I offered him a joint and he says, are you trying to get me stoned, Lou? I laughed, I'll try anything. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's a link in the chat to um, We Both Laughed in Pleasure. And our, um, will you advance the slides, Joan? Oh, OK, yeah. So do you want to actually just tell us a little about these slides that are still up? Yeah, um, th this is from uh, the first edition of Lou's Info to the Female to Male Crossdresser and Transvestite or something. I can't remember. I always flip the two. Um, so it was kind of his like informational guidebook and practical guidebook for trans men about how to tips on passing and, you know, kind of like social info. Um, and this one's just uh, pretty funny because it's, I don't know, it's a trans mask how to look 30 when you're 30, um, the perpetual struggle. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's what's going on here. Uh, and then this uh, is a beautiful illustration um, by Mars Hilbrecker, who's an interdisciplinary artist who primarily um, works in tattoos at the moment, um, who uh, drew this portrait based on um, one of the earlier photos you saw in the slideshow that I believe was taken by Lou's mom, um, who helped him rent a tuxedo um, for a drag ball that he was going to in Milwaukee. And then that's probably my, my favorite um, portrait of Lou. Uh, this is a scan of a copy of The Advocate. Um, and this image ran along with an article about Lou called Sullivan's Travels. Thank you so much, Zach and Ellis. And if you don't already have, um, we both laughed in pleasure. I really encourage you to get it. It's a beautiful collection. Um, so this is a photograph, I think, from 1999 of Leslie Feinberg and Minnie Bruce Pratt. And um, Andrea and Kay are going to read the contribution um, letters, uh, letter to Teresa that's uh, reproduced in the book. And so we've gathered um, a number of, oh yes, and there is a free download of Stonewish Blues. Um, will you go to the next slide, Joan? Uh, I wanted to just share very briefly this um, project that um, two artists, Nancy Brooks Brody and Russell Perkins have proposed um, as a permanent monument to Leslie Feinberg at the LGBT Center in New York. And it's called from using Leslie's archive at the Sexual Minorities um, Archive in Northampton that Ben Powers runs. And it's taking marginalia from Leslie's books in the library, which is reproduced there. Um, 
to propose this kind of these etchings underneath the bottom of the stair undersides of the the parts of the center that have not undergone a renovation for those of you who know that space um, can you show the next slide um, and this is just a description of the project um, for anybody who's interested in reading more it's about kind of spaces of margin and in between um, and again it's kind of taken from their from the margin notes of leslie's books and so noam parness is here with us unfortunately ariel goldberg wasn't able to join us today but noam and ariel curated an exhibition of robert jared's photographs which include images of leslie feinberg and noam is here to kind of share a little bit about those images um, and then also as we're going through you'll see a number of images that i pulled primarily from two issues of trans sisters from 92 and 93 of um, interviews with Leslie, as well as um, documentation of organizing from uh, the first Camp Trans in 1994, but also documentation of the protests that began in 92 when Nancy Burkholder was um, forcibly removed from the festival. And so you can see some of the some of this work as it as it goes by. There's also a great photo. There's some great photographs of Leslie and Minnie there, along with Ricky Ann Wilkins um, in her transsexual menace T-shirt. Um, no, I'm kind of, oh, well, so we'll go through these a little bit. Um, um, so there's uh, Rick Ann Wilkins in the center, Leslie Feinberg, and then Minnie in the hat. And can, Joan, can you skip to the, um, oh, this was a, a great quote male energy now that it's frighteningly subjective order for a security team to patrol. Um, will you skip that? Oh yeah, just, I guess, go through these. <laughs> and then, um, okay, so here's the contact sheets from the Beinecke Rare Book Room at Yale University um, of Robert Giard. So I'm gonna ask Noam to join us on screen and share a little bit about them. And Noam is a curator at the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art. Hi, um, thanks so much. Um, I'm sorry, Arielle can't be here, but um, happy to humbly fill in uh, on, their, on their behalf. Um, yeah, so these images uh, were taken actually on my and Arielle's phones at the Beinecke when we were there a year ago uh, doing research for our exhibition or probably a year and a half ago. Um, and just to give you some context on these contact sheets. So Robert Giard uh, was a photographer um, who died in 2002 and he embarked on a project called Particular Voices, Portraits of Gay and Lesbian Writers, uh, in which he documented over 600 LGBTQ writers uh, between 1985 and up until his death in 2002. And it was an incredibly laborious project. Um, he would often correspond with people, read their work, um, come to them and talk to them about their lives and their work. And so these images were taken in 1993 uh, in Jersey City uh, in their home. And in addition to these images, uh, Giard actually journaled for each photo shoot, and which is an incredible archive of memory of the encounters with these authors. And these journals were actually sealed for 20 years and only became available to researchers at the New York Public Library two years ago. And so Arielle and I really used those journals to explore the photographic process and what happened both in and outside of the images that became known. So I'm just gonna read an excerpt from that journal entry by Robert Giard. Okay. Minnie Bruce Pratt and Leslie Feinberg, Friday, October 93, 11 a.m. I wait down below outside turnstile at Journal Square and see them coming down the stairs, no escalator, holding hands and looking into each other's eyes. MVP, happy. Oh, I should note MVP is Minnie Bruce Pratt and LF is Leslie Feinberg. Um, I should also note that um, this journal entry, uh, Giard refers to Leslie as she. Um, and just as a heads up, uh, I did not have time to fix that, but I will. Uh, Z and here are Leslie's, uh, as from what I understand, preferred, or are Leslie's pronouns. Um, although someone please correct me if that's incorrect. Um, so, LF clearly loves her. LF has a wonderful face, handsome, serious, warm, refined in feature. I like both of them enormously. It's fun being with them. 
we talk about Outright 93, which was a conference uh, yearly held for writers, for LGBTQ writers. They felt their conversation on gender was a highlight, that people in the audience went from cautious to supportive. Also, Louise Alfaro. LF refers to self as transgender, suggests Kay Bornstein to me. MVP also suggests deaf poet whose thesis she advised. We sit and chat in charming, airy apartment. MVP's boys, one Arabic studies, other queer studies at Duke where she may be placing her papers. MVP, cramps, I know trips to bathroom. LF massages her feet, points for cramps. What stands out? I note MVP's unshaven legs. LF Rubenesque posterior as she looks out window. They are so at ease with me and in love with each other. So cooperative with being pictured. I hope I do justice to what they are giving. MVP has a tie on each shot for first roll or two. LF in utter concentration on camera. MVP continually looks lovingly at LF while MVP is being photographed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noah. Um, and so, Andrea and Kay, you're gonna read? Um, I think I'm just gonna read from it, um, or that's what we had planned. So, um, I'm gonna read from Letter to Teresa, which is the opening of Stonebush Blues that we republished in We Want It All. And I want to shout out Minnie Bruce Pratt for, um, for the rights and for just being an, an amazing person to be in, in correspondence with throughout the publication of We Want It All. She's super excited about it. And she kind of is just like, it lives on, like, take it away, um, which is awesome. So. And the spread looks like this, if, if you all haven't seen it yet. And thank you, Noam, for the presentation about the photos and the journal entry. Oh my god, so, so powerful. Dear Teresa, I'm lying on my bed tonight missing you. My eyes all swollen, hot tears running down my face. There's a fierce summer lightning storm raging outside. Tonight I walk down streets looking for you in every woman's face as I have each night of this lonely exile. I'm afraid I'll never see your laughing, teasing the eyes again. I had coffee in Greenwich Village earlier with a woman, a mutual friend fixed us up. Sure, we'd have a lot in common since we're both into politics. Well, we sat in a coffee shop and she talked about democratic politics and seminars and photography and problems with her co-op and how she's so opposed to rent control. Small wonder. Daddy is a real estate developer. I was looking at her while she was talking, thinking to myself that I'm a stranger in this woman's eyes. She's looking at me, but she doesn't see me. Then she finally said how she hates this society for what it's done to women like me, who hate themselves so much they have to look and act like men. I felt myself getting flushed and my face twitched a little and I started telling her, all cool and calm, about how women like me existed since the dawn of time before there was oppression and how those societies respected them. And she got very interested, a very interested expression on and besides, it was time to leave. So we walked by a corner where these cops were laying into a homeless man and I stopped and mouthed off to one of the cops and they started coming at me with their clubs raised and she tugged my belt to pull me back. I just looked at her and suddenly things, I felt things well up in me that I thought I had buried. I stood there remembering you like I didn't see cops about to hit me, like I was falling back into another world, a place I wanted to go again. And suddenly my heart hurt so bad and I realized how long it's been since my heart felt anything. I need to go home to you tonight, Teresa. I can't, so I'm writing you this letter. I remember years ago, the day I started working at the cannery in Buffalo and you had already been there a few months and how your eyes caught mine and played with me before you set me free. I was supposed to be following the foreman to fill out some forms, but I was so busy wondering what color your hair was under that white paper and how it would look and feel in my fingers drawn loose and free. And I remember how you laughed gently when the foreman came back and said, you coming or not? All of us, he, she's were mad as hell when we heard you got fired because you wouldn't let the superintendent touch your breasts. I still unloaded on the docks for another couple days, but I was kind of mopey. It, was, it just wasn't the same after your light went out. I couldn't believe it the night I went to the club on the west side. There you were leaning up against the bar, your jeans too tight for words and your hair, your hair all loose and free. 
And I remember that look in your eyes again. You didn't just know me, you liked what you saw. And this time, oh woman, we were on our own turf. I could move the way you wanted me to. And I was glad I'd gotten all dressed up. On our own turf, would you dance with me? You didn't say yes or no. You just squeezed me with your eyes, straightened my tie, smoothed my collar and took me by the hand. You had my heart before you moved against me like you did. Tammy was singing, stand by your man. And we were keeping all the keys to shoes inside our heads to make it fit right. After you moved that way, you had more than my heart. You had made me ache and you liked that. So did I. The older butchers warned me, if you wanted to keep your marriage, don't go to the bars. But I've always been a one woman butch. Besides, this is our community, the only one we belong to. So we went every weekend. There were two kinds of fights in the bars. Most weekends had one, or one kind or the other, some weekends both. There were fist fights between the butch women, full of booze, shame, jealous, and security. Sometimes the fights were awful and spread like a web to trap everyone in the bar. Like the night Hetty lost her eye when she got hit upside the head with the bar stool. I was real proud that in all those years, I never hit another butch woman. See, I loved them too. And I understood their pain and their shame because I was so much like them. I love the lines etched in their faces and hands and the curves of their work weary shoulders. Sometimes I looked in the mirror and wondered what it would look like when I was their age. Now I know. In their own way, they love me too. They protected me because they knew I wasn't a Saturday night butch. The weekend butches were scared of me because I was a stone he, she. If only they had known how powerless I really felt inside. But the older butches, they knew the whole road that lay ahead of me and they wished I didn't have to go down it because it hurt so much. When I came into the bar and drag, kind of hunched over, they told me, be proud of what you are. And then they adjusted my tie, sort of like you did. I was like them. They knew I didn't have a choice. So I never fought them with my fists. We clapped each other on the back in the bars and watched each other's backs at the factory. But then there were the times our real enemies came in the front door. Drunken gangs of sailors, clan type thugs, sociopaths and cops. You always knew when they walked in because someone thought to pull the plug on the jukebox. No matter how many times it happened, we still went awe when the music stopped. And then we realized it was time to get down to business. When the bigots came in, it was time to fight. And fight, we did. Fought hard, femme and butch, women and men together. If the music stopped and it was the cops at the door, someone plugged the music back in and we switched dance partners. Us and our suits and ties paired off with our dry queen sisters in their dresses and pumps. Hard to remember that it was illegal then for two women or two men to sway to music together. When the music ended, the butches bowed and our femme partners curtsied and we returned to our seats, our lovers, our drinks to await our fates. That's when I remember your hand on my belt up under my suit jacket. That's where your hand stayed the whole time the cops were there. Take it easy, honey. Stay with me, baby. Cool off. We'd be cooing into my ear like a special lover's song sung to warriors who need to pick and choose their battles in order to survive. We learned fast that the cops always pulled the police van right up to the bar door and left snarling dogs inside so we couldn't get out. We were trapped, all right. Remember the night you stayed home with me? I was so sick. That was the night, you remember. The cops picked up the most stone butch of them, all to destroy with humiliation. A woman, everyone said, wore, wore, everyone said, wore a raincoat in the shower. We heard they stripped her slow in front of everyone in the bar and laughed at her, trying to cover up her nakedness. Later, she went mad, they said. Later, she hung herself. What would I have done if I had been there that night? I'm, re I'm remembering the bus in the bars in Canada, packed with police vans, all the Saturday night bitches giggled and tried to fluff up their hair and switch clothing so they could get thrown in the tank with the femme women, said it would be like dying and going to heaven. The law said we had to be wearing three pieces of women's clothing. We never switched clothing, neither did our drag queen sisters. We knew, and so did you, what was coming. We needed our sleeves rolled up, our hair slicked back in order to live through it. Our hands were cuffed tight behind our backs. Yours were cuffed in front. You loosened my tie, unbuttoned my collar and touched my face. I saw the pain and fear for me in your face and I whispered it would be all right. We knew it wouldn't be. I never told you what they did to us down there. Queens in one tank, stone butchers in the next, but you knew. One at a time, they would drag our brothers out of the cells, slapping and punching them, locking the bars behind them fast in case we lost control and tried to stop them if we could. They'd handcuff a brother's wrist to his ankles or chain his face against the bars. They made us watch. Sometimes we'd catch the eyes of the terrorized victim or the soon-to-be caught in the vise of torture. 
And we'd say gently, I'm with you, honey, look at me. It's okay, we'll take you home. We never cried in front of the cops. We knew we were next. The next time the cell door opens, it, will it be me? They drag out and chain spread eagle to the bars. Did I survive? I guess I did, but only because I knew I might get home to you. They let us out last, one at a time on Monday morning, no charges. Too late to call in sick to work, no money, hitchhiking, crossing the border on foot, rumpled clothes, bloody, needing a shower, hurt, scared. I, I knew you'd be home if I could get there. You ran a bath for me with sweet smelling bubbles. You laid out a fresh pair of white BBDs and a t-shirt for me and left me alone to wash off the first layer of shame. I remember it was always the same. I was put on the briefs and then I just put the t-shirt over my head and you would find some reason to come into the bathroom to get something or to put something away. In a glance, you would memorize the wounds upon my body like a road map, the gashes, bruises, cigarette burns. Later in bed, you helped me. You held me gently, caressing me everywhere, the tenderest touches reserved for the places I was hurt, knowing each and every sore place inside and out. You didn't flirt with me right away, knowing I wasn't confident enough to feel sexy, but slowly you coaxed my pride back out again by showing me how much you wanted me. You knew it would take you weeks to, again to melt the stone. Lately, I've read these stories by women who are so angry with stone lovers, even mocking their passion when they finally give way to trust to being touched. And I'm wondering, did it hurt you times I couldn't let you touch me? I hope it didn't. You never showed it if it did. I think you knew it wasn't always you I was keeping myself safe from. You treated my stone, my stone self as a wound that needed loving, healing. Thank you. No one's ever done that since. If you were here tonight, well, it's hypothetical, isn't it? I never said these things to you. Tonight, I remember the time I got busted alone on strange turf. You're probably wincing already, but I have to say this to you. It was the night we drove 90 miles to a bar to meet friends who never showed up. When the police raided the club, we were alone and the cop with gold bars on his uniform came right over to me and told me to stand up. No wonder I was the only he, she in the place that night. He put his hands all over me, pulled up the band of my jockeys and told his men to cuff me. I didn't have three pieces of women's clothing on. I wanted to fight right then and there because I knew the chance to be lost in a moment. But I always knew that everyone would be beaten that night if I fought back. So I just stood there. I saw they had pinned your arms behind your back and cuffed your hands. One cop had his arm across your throat. I remember the look in your eyes. It hurts me even now. They cuffed my hands so tight behind my back I almost cried out. Then the cop unzipped his pants real slow with a smirk on his face and ordered me down on my knees. First, I thought to myself, I can't. And then I said out loud to myself and you to him, I won't. I never told you this before, but something changed inside me in that moment. I learned the difference between what I can't do and what I refuse to do. I paid the price for that lesson. Do I have to tell you every detail? Of course not. When I got out of the tank the next morning, you were there. You bailed me out, no charges. They just kept your money. You had waited all night long in that police station. Only I knew how hard it was for you to withstand their leers, their taunts, their threats. I knew you cringed with every sound you strained to hear from back in the cells. You prayed you wouldn't hear me scream. I didn't. I remember when we got outside the parking lot, you stopped and put your hands lightly on my shoulder and avoided my eyes. You gently rubbed the bloody places on my shirt and said, I'll never get these stains up. Damn, anyone who thinks that means you were relegated in life to worrying about my rings around the collar. I knew exactly what you meant. It was such an oddly sweet way of saying or not saying what you were feeling. Sort of the way I shut down emotionally when I feel scared and hurt and helpless and say funny little things that seem so out of context. You drove us home with my head in your lap all the way. Stroking my face, you ran the bath, set out the fresh underwear, put me to bed, caressed me carefully, held me gently. Later that night, I woke up and found myself alone in bed. You were drinking at the kitchen table, head in your hands. You were crying. I took you firmly in my arms and held you, and you struggled and bit my chest with your fists because the enemy wasn't there to fight. Moments later, you recalled the bruises on my chest and cried even harder, sobbing. It's my fault. I couldn't stop them. I've always wanted to tell you this. In that one moment, I knew you really did understand how I felt in life, choking on anger, feeling so powerless, unable to protect myself or those I love most yet fighting back again and again, unwilling to give up. I didn't have the words to tell you this then. I just said, it'll be okay, it'll be all right. And then we smiled ironically at what I'd said. I took you back to our bed and made the best love to you I could considering the shape I was in. You knew not to try to touch me that night. You just ran your fingers through my hair and cried and cried. When we did get separated in life, sweet warrior woman, we thought we'd won the war of liberation. 
and we embraced the word gay. Then suddenly there were professors and doctors and lawyers coming out of the woodwork telling us that meetings should be run with the Robert's, Robert's Rules of Orders. Who died and left Robert God? They drove us out and made us feel ashamed of how we looked. They said we were male chauvinist pigs, the enemy. It was women's hearts they broke. We were not so hard to send away. We went quickly. The plants closed, something we could never have imagined. That's when I began passing as a man, strange to be exiled from your own sex to borders that will never be home. You were banished too to another land with your own sex, yet forcibly apart from the women you loved as much as you tried to love yourself. For more than 20 years, I have lived on this lonely shore, wondering what became of you. Did you wash off your Saturday night makeup in shame? Did you burn in anger when women said, if I wanted a man, I'd be with a real one? Are you turning tricks today? Are you waiting tables or learning Word Perfect 5.1? Are you in a lesbian bar looking out the corner of your eye for the butchest woman in the room? Do the women there talk about democratic politics and seminars and co-ops? Are you with women who only bleed monthly on their cycles? Or are you married in another blue collar town, lying with an unemployed auto worker who is much more like me than they are, listening for the even breathing of your sleeping children? Did you bind his emotional wounds the way you tried to heal mine? Do you ever think of me in the cool night? I've been writing this letter to you for hours. My ribs hurt from a recent beating, you know. I never could have survived this long if I had never known your love. Yet I still ache with missing you and need you so. Only you can melt this stone. Are you ever coming back? The storm is past now. There is a pink glow of light on the horizon outside my window. I am remembering the nights I fucked you deep and slow until the sky was just this color. I can't think about you anymore. The pain is swallowing me up. I have to put your memory away like a precious sapia photograph. There are still so many things I want to tell you, to share with you. Since I can't mail you this letter, I'll send it to a place where they keep women's memories safe. Maybe someday passing through this big city, you will stop and read it. Maybe you won't. Good night, my love. Thank you so much, Andrea. Our um, next reading is going to be of uh, Bryn Kelly. Uh, Gaines, are you here? I found this, um, or did you send me this amazing photo of Leslie and Bryn together um, from 2006? And we're really happy that Bryn's work is in the anthology and uh, Gaines, Bryn's partner, is going to read it for us. Thank you so much. Um, just to set a little context, um, Bryn lived in the Midwest um, in the early 2000s, was born in Ohio, was trans in Ohio and West Virginia and Michigan, um, where this photo was taken. Um, and it's funny that Mitch Fest is kind of a through line um, from the last uh, reader to this one. Um, also because uh, it, it represents a fun intersection of the internet and real, real life IRL community for Bryn um, because she uh, was hospitality coordinator at Camp Trans um, for several years and was introduced to Camp Trans and um, that contemporary trans movement through the website strapon.org, um, which was an early uh, precedent, I guess, to what we now think Tumblr and other um, generations of internet trans technology. Um, so when she went to Mitch Fest, she actually knew many people, both from at Camp Trans um, and from strapon.org, as well as Midwestern lesbians who she knew from gay bars. Um, so it's just a, a fun intersection. And the piece that I'm reading is from a blog post um, from her Tumblr blog, um, which uh, she was writing in one or more several trans voices on Tumblr a decade ago, um, which I think is interesting for me as someone who is also a trans on Tumblr a decade ago to recognize this now as part of our history. Um, so I am dropping us in partway through this piece where Bryn has talked about Adrian Rich, uh, the lesbian feminist poet who collaborated with Terps, um, and also a lesbian in the 70s conference that she had attended. 
When I see people posting reverently about Adrian Rich in the past couple days, it inspires this panic response in me. You are not my friend. You do not have my back. I knew it. I knew you would bail all along and that I could never trust you. And here you are showing your true colors. We are not on the same team. We never were. It is always a lie. Fuck you. I end up feeling this way kind of a lot. My internet cuts a pretty wide swath through a couple different queer communities. And something like this always reminds me of how we are so different and how difference is this gulf between people that can never be totally filled and only shakily bridged and how all this factors into a fundamental impossibility of communication. It is a bummer. Not to put too fine a point on it, but the people I know who are posting about Adrian Rich break into two camps. One, people who love trans women and are like, uh, hey guys. And two, people who do not seem to care a whole lot about us, who post uncritical gush. Like, I mean, you would think Whitney up and died all over again. And certainly, though no one is necessarily obliged to care about trans women, I guess, it all just makes me feel more isolated, more alone, more ostracized, more of a pariah, more shame, which are feelings I spend a lot of time feeling anyway. I don't remember what Adrian Rich said that night at the Lesbians in the 70s conference, but it's on the internet. However, so is a speech that Frances Golden gave the same night. She basically burned the roof down of that place. I will tell you, old radicals are my favorite radicals. I know it's easy to hate on newly fired up, barely post-adolescent revolutionaries, hashtag Occupy, but it really renews your faith to meet people who have spent a lifetime busting ass and busting heads and have won a few rounds with the man. You can really learn a thing or two from these folks sometimes. Do yourself a favor and watch that clip all the way through. It is eight minutes long, which is like a lifetime in YouTube time, and the sound is patchy, but it's worth it. If you can't manage that, Tumblr generation, let me quote, for instance, some of her concluding remarks. I want to tell you, your life will be made sweet by comrades and friends, and it doesn't come naturally. It takes a lot of work. And the quote proceeds about what this work looks like. It's really beautiful. I recommend you read it. After that quote continues. Figuring out how to live life together is hard. So this is now Ren's words again. To exist in community with people who constantly piss you off is exhausting, but ultimately worth it. As Miss Golden says, it is sweet. But in between, there are these things that set our teeth on edge about each other. And we start smiling the kind of smiles that are about bearing teeth to each other. We don't let it show that it stings or we shrug it off like it's no big deal. And we keep a running catalog of hurts in our head and a dossier of every aesthetic political statement everyone we ever know has ever made in public and index it against our own internal emotional safety actuarial matrices. And sometimes if we trust you, we send you a text or give you a call, or whisper to you at a party, or point blank bring it up while we're making you lunch. Hey, did you know you hurt me? Can we talk about that? I think I trust you enough to be vulnerable enough to tell you about this, even though it's going to make me come off like, make me seem like an oversensitive bitch. I suppose that's just how you get through with other people, because the only way to get through it is with other people. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that and bringing Ben's words into this space. And thank you, Andrea and Kay, for including, including her. Um, so we're going to have one uh, final presentation by Sasha, Sasha Wurzel, who is here. And um, we're going to set up the film. Um, and if you have any questions or thoughts that you want to put into the chat that the editors and speakers can address as this um, comes to a close, then feel free to do that. Um, and I'm going to introduce Sasha, who is a filmmaker um, whose many films um, include This Is an Address, 
um, with Tourmaline, Happy Birthday, Marsha, We Have Always Been on Fire, um, Lost in the Music, and um, Sasha's going to share a little bit about the excerpt of um, the film that we're going to watch. Hello. Hi. You're not going to wear your dinosaur sweater? Oh, snap. I have a dinosaur sweater. I have sweater. to change. Why? Because I have a dinosaur shirt that I could be wearing. Okay. You need to do that really quickly? Yeah. Two minutes? Yeah. Um, it's not today? I thought it was today. Chad said it was today. I was confused. I'm going to change. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I have no clue what that is. Yeah. Sasha, do you want to... Um... Do you want to unmute? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> um, sorry, I was trying to unmute. Ah, Zoom, the glitch. Hi. Um, can people see me? Okay, great. It's unclear to me on my view right now. Um, thanks so much for having me. And it's really an honor to be part of this event. Um, it's, the book is really beautiful. Congratulations to all the, and thank you to all the readers. Um, just to set up this film, this is an address. Um, about 10 years ago, I was working on a film with the artist Tourmaline, Happy Birthday, Marsha, and she showed me this incredible footage that belonged to Randy Wicker and was filmed in 1995 of Sylvia Rivera um, living on um, the Hudson River piers which um, on this location that's now adjacent to the Whitney Museum. And that footage really moved me, but it didn't make it into our project at the time. But then five years after first encountering that footage, I was hired to work in the education department at a new location of the Whitney Museum that had just opened in the meatpacking district. Um, and on my first day in the office, I looked out the windows of the education department and noticed that I was looking at the Hudson River at the very site where Sylvia had been living 20 years prior and was interviewed in this footage by Randy Wicker. She's living there alongside other queer and trans unhoused folks, people who are HIV positive, disabled, and taking care of one another. Um, meanwhile, while working at the museum, I was watching all this drastic kind of redevelopment of the waterfront, watching this place just transform before our eyes. So. I started to document that change. And so the result is this film, This is an Address, which layers my footage of the meatpacking district in the Hudson River now, alongside this footage by Randy Wicker from 1995. And I think we're gonna play a five minute excerpt, but the, the film is completely free and available online to watch in full um, at Field Division. Um, so I encourage you to do that. And thank you again for including me in this really beautiful event, celebrating some really important thinkers and writers. And drawing, you know, drawing the beginning of the drawing out, out mm -hmm. in the street, but... They didn't have homeless encampments in those days. We didn't. Did they? We, we slept in hallways. Or either Marsh or I had a hotel room where we snuck everybody in. Now, do they, is this, the, does this belong to the city? This the property? The property belongs yeah. to the city. It does. The end of my house is the dividing line between that world and our world. We've been homeless for the most part of eight years. My lover has AIDS dementia. Um, very, he's getting to the very serious stage now, you know, the last stage. I was diagnosed in 1985, and so was he when they called it HTLV-3, not HIV. We're still alive. So have you gone to places like GMHC? Yeah, they've turned me down. Uh, On what basis? I walked in and I said, I'm homeless, I have AIDS, and I need assistance, and they would say, there is no services available for you here. 
They said you had to have an address. I said, well, I have. It just doesn't have a number. It, it hurts to see that people are not being helped. I may spend the winter out here for the simple fact that if I can't see them off the street, why should I go get shelter for myself? I have to prove a point as a Stonewall but, veteran. But hurting yourself doesn't do us no good. I'm, I'm flabbergasted because, I mean, I, I consider myself very aware on all these AIDS issues. The Gay Community Center, walk right up there and ask, what kind of, what kind of uh, support do you have for us? Uh, they, they give away, the well, they give... Right down. I don't think that a lot of uh, gay people ever think of gays being homeless and living, you know, in lean-tos like this. And we are in the village. And, uh, We're in and the then, middle of the gay gallery. Right. But they'll see you pushing a shopping cart. They know you're gay because they've seen you around for years, okay? But because you're homeless, suddenly it's because you're bad. You've done something wrong. That's the way they look at you, and they, they walk away, they turn their back on you. But if, if they could just understand what we're saying now, that's not the story. There's always someone here watching someone else's camp. We always have that agreement. We share amongst ourselves. We can unmute and do some clapping. <laughs> Yay. Thank you so much, Sasha. Thank you so much, Sasha. And Gaines and Ellis and Zach. And Noam. And Noam and Jean and Kay. And Andrea. <laughs> Um, and thank you all for coming. And um, I think that we have some time just to talk um, amongst ourselves about the various overlaps between these different texts and, and, and documents, um, the relationship between those and, and the rest of the book. Um, uh, yeah, I don't really know kind of where to take it from here, but I, I'm I seeing everything really kind of combined at one time, um, uh, I, I think is somehow like very productive actually. Yeah, we definitely have some time for people to unmute and share. Um, oh, there's a question. Um, do Zach and Ellis know if Lou and Leslie ever met or corresponded? 
That is a good question. Zach, do we know? I don't think we know. Not as far as I know, and it seems like something we would have remembered. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's there's a lot of correspondence, um, but it's um yeah, I, I have no no memory of 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 that. I think I remember asking you both like a year and a half ago and you also didn't know then, but that is, that would be a gold mine. Though to be fair, we, you know, the Lou's correspondences were outside the scope of our project. So that isn't a part of the archive where I've personally spent as much time as I've spent with the diaries. I, I think they just redid, um, GLBT just redid the finding aid um, uh, for the, the collection, loose collection there. Um, so I'm sure that if, the, if they are there, there's reference to, so be worth checking out if you're interested. So the Leslie Feinberg finding aid for sexual minorities is also very um, accessible and thorough. I could drop that into the chat. There was a lot of content presented, so we would love some questions. Some also um, our various presenters, if you want to ask each other questions, we love that too. I actually have a question for everyone involved. Um, as a lot of folks talked about earlier, like it's been very important and very amazing to be able to revisit these archives. I feel like at this point right now, where we're finally kind of waking up to the idea that the archive is important and the trans archive specifically is very important because it's so sparse in terms of like the higher ed stratosphere. I guess my question for everyone involved was, what was it like bringing all of these folks who are incredibly anti-establishment into this kind of collected text? Like a lot of these people in this book would roll their eyes at the idea of a book. And so, I'm interested in hearing about how everyone who either um, curated work or found work or helped in the project itself, how, how that process was for you to kind of be working with these radical trans narratives and knowing that they're going to be necessary because even 10 years out, we see that the, just a simple blog post or you know a diary can become so poignant. How are you all working to like, continue to build on the trans archive? while also honoring the legacies of the people um, who are featured. I actually have, a, I think that's a great question. Um, and I have one response. I, I do want kind of people who are sort of individual archivists um, um, to, to, to talk about that too. But I think, you know, like um, Leslie Feinberg, I think is actually someone who uh, I look to as, as someone who's thinking a lot um, throughout um, uh, throughout your work about um, the relationship between culture and struggle. Um, and you can see that in, for instance, um, Lavender and Red, which is the column that Leslie wrote for, you know, whatever you think about the party, for Workers' World um, and for the Workers' World magazine. And, 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 and so, um, and, and, and like, you know, that's, that's a kind of complicated uh, history, we might not all have share that same particular tendency. We uh, might not, you know, especially like agree with say some of the stuff that like Leslie wrote about Cuba, for instance. I mean, it's, it's complicated, right? It's historically complicated. But um, uh, 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 like uh, like Feinberg is definitely thinking about um, uh, um, the book and and like the journal as ways to um, work with people and to change a, a, a kind of relationship of consciousness, uh, specifically about who is in the movement, right? Um, also, I think because like Feinberg was writing at a moment when um, the left, the mainstream left in the US between the 70s and the 90s was extremely homophobic and extremely, what we would say now, transphobic. Um, so I think that, that that is, it's kind of, there there is a kind of, more, I would say, more complicated relationship to the book, um, if that makes sense. Um, and of course, Stone Butch Blues is a book that they, you know, that 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 um, uh, uh, excuse me, wrote and published in 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 uh, like you know, uh, uh, and and is you know available still to read um, and download online.
Thank you. Another thing I want to say about <clears throat> the anthology as a book project is um, we thought a lot about like forms, like poets love to talk about forms and Stonebush Blues is prose and the Sylvia Rivera piece that we republished is a speech that she gave called Bitch on Wheels, um, which is amazing and you should all read it. It's also available for free online in a zine. Um, which is where we found it. And it's it's one of those speeches that isn't, it doesn't get a lot of airtime. And it talks a lot about um, Stonewall and how trans women are always on the front lines fighting, but other types of gays are not, obviously. And it also talks a lot, the interest, a lot about the interesting economics that were going on at the Stonewall Bar, like between NYPD and the mafia and all this stuff. Um, so you have to read it. And when we were putting together the book, we were, we were putting together a book, like we were not putting together like a movement, but it's it serves its purpose in being important in, as far as like being connective and being agitative. And we really wanted to resist the idea that like poems have to look like poems, which is why I wanted to include works by people that we have learned from and are inspired by. Um, but maybe, you know, like if um, Ellis and Zach or, or Sasha, if you guys want to talk about um, what what you guys, what, like how you, um, like if you want to respond to Mason's question and how you relate um, to doing the archival work and respecting um, the kind of the, the positions of um, the people you work with, like with respect to publication, um, uh, I, I'd be curious to know that the answer to that too. Yeah, um, sure. Thank you. Um, thanks, Mason, for your question. I think I think we um, and Zach ho hop on here too. <laughs> I think that we definitely did um, a lot of thinking um, about you know, like particularly in the moment in which you know Lou passed in ninety one, Zach was born in ninety two, I was born in ninety three, and so we had this like lovely kind of crossing of of ships and and thinking about you know, we sort of inherited a moment that Lou was right up against, but wasn't actually in. And how do we, how do we hold that space um, and, and really honor, you know, what he did and how he did it. And um, yeah, I don't know, Zach, if you want to say some things too. Well, I think for me, some of Lou's own life practices make it feel easier for me to work with his archive. Um, for one thing, you know, he uh, he had like a printing company um, with one of his boyfriends and would typeset newsletters for multiple organizations. Um, you know, he self-published his own guide that we showed some images from earlier. Um, and I think, and, you know, and he did all of his correspondences. So I would see Lou's movement work, community work, as being one that was very text-based, um, whether it was personal or in publications. Um, so, and there's something also about his, his enthusiasm for publication and like for notoriety for his writing throughout his lifetime um, that, ta that takes some of the pressure off for me. Um, so I'm curious to see what people who have, um, you know, worked with an archive that maybe is a little bit more ambiguous in its relationship to publicity have to say. Um, but thanks for your question, Mason. Um, I can also talk a little bit about uh, working with Bryn's work. Um, and it's interesting because, like I mentioned, there are a couple Tumblr voices that she used or different writing projects in different voices. And this piece specifically was published under her name, like BrynKelly.tumblr. Um, and um, there were, uh, there was other work that after her death, I was sort of like not precious about. It was just like, yeah, this is all Bryn's work. Um, now it's sort of known under one name if someone cares to look. 
Um, so this piece in particular, it's, it doesn't feel fraught to include it in a publication. And similarly, um, given that Rin was identified as a writer, actually was in other anthologies um, that she chose to put work in during her lifetime, like that doesn't feel fraught. I think, um, you know, using, uh, publishing under a name, a pseudonym um, doesn't inherently mean that someone doesn't want that work to be collected in this way. Um, I think a lot of Bryn's choices around like forum and genre and using Tumblr in the way that she did came from assuming that the establishment would never be interested in her work um, and that she, or you know, her lived experience that the establishment wasn't interested in her work um, and that in her lifetime she would have chosen to um, work it felt very easy and clear to me that she would have chosen to be included in something like this. Ted, do you want to say anything about publishing Bryn's writing and um, We Who Feel Differently? Just you on the spot, Tim. Yeah. Uh, um, I asked Bryn if she was working on anything and if she would be willing to submit something. I was collecting fiction and nonfiction for a, a publication called We Who Feel Differently, the journal. It's an art project by Carlos, Carlos Mota. And uh, there was a journal uh, section that I edited and uh, Bryn said yes. And um, uh, Bryn, Bryn deserved a better editor than me. Um, which was really interesting. And I'm sure Gaines has insight into this, but like, I just kind of fangirled. And so every time I read a draft, I was like, it's so good, which for every writer in this room knows that as much as you might want to get positive feedback, there's that feeling right afterwards where you're like, but no, like, no, like give me some pushback, give me something to work with. Like my first draft was not good, you're lying. Um, and so I think actually in the end, Bryn having to kind of explain things to me um, helped her make the piece better. I remember meeting her in a coffee shop and her being nervous and me being like, it's so good. And she's like, and then me not even understanding the title. And once she understood how little I understood of it, she rewrote it and it got better for both of us. Um, yeah, and I was, yeah. And I'm really interested in what Gain said about the, the space between anonymity and having pseudonyms and and just that complex thing. I think like every, like in the HIV world, there's this idea of being AIDS famous. So like you'll be famous in the AIDS world, um, but that might never translate beyond the world of HIV. Um, and so it's interesting to think about what does it mean to be like poetry famous or trans famous or Brooklyn famous? Um, and how does that work with anonymity and pseudonyms and how does that change when like the internet is not Tumblr anymore and that sucks. Um, so I'm thinking about how, how anonymity online doesn't work as well as it used to. That's what I'm thinking about. Sorry, I'm late and out of breath. <laughs> no, that was great. Um, Sasha, I saw you unmuted for a second before. Do you wanna talk about your work with Sylvia? Sure, I guess. Um... Yeah, I've been thinking about, I mean, the question of how one works with archives is definitely something that I'm thinking a lot about in my own work. And I, um, to answer the previous question a little bit, I think whenever I'm, I'm often kind of very interested in how to, rather than sort of um, fix history, how to kind of mine those gaps for something new altogether and thinking about this idea that if it is, um, if many institutions and maybe higher education, which was referenced as not going to document our history or is going to do so in a way that um, really makes us sort of the object of archives and doesn't include us in the actual imagining of what that archive looks like. I think a lot about just my filmmaking practices, how to kind of create some kind of cinematic language that is both kind of doing that work and honoring and giving back to these people who have really shaped our lives and given so much, but have not gotten their 
maybe shine or attention or um, been honored in the in their lifetimes, especially how to how to sort of give back to them while also making work that can simultaneously be interrogating why that erasure and that violence occurs and how to do so in a way where we're not just reproducing that. But I just think there's a lot of power that if, if our lives and what matters to us and the sort of textures and richness is not being archived, um, how do we get to kind of reimagine what that past looks like altogether? Um, and how can that tell us new things about what we wanna to do together now and how we wanna care for one another? So yeah, thanks for that question. And I think a lot of the work we're looking at and listening to tonight does just that. So thank you all. There's a question in the chat, um, which I can read. It's how do y'all think trans knowledge and care might be archived, especially in from digital presences since queerness slash transness isn't a monolith, does digitalness add or take open-ended? And I'll maybe just say a tiny thing about working in an archive, which is um, that what is there is very much, it's, a, it's haphazard, it's a kind of a reflection of the kind of segregationist practices that happen in queer culture and in all, you know, all kind of cultures, but um, that we're kind of trying to drop some links that have accessible materials and the digital transgender archive, archive in particular has so much um, preserved. And what's really interesting about it is that it's kind of um, drawing from all these LGBT collections, many of which maybe sort of misarchive or kind of um, categorize or contextualize trans life under um, other names. Uh, and so it's kind of trying to do that work of of naming practices and, and, and how important that is in terms of historical um, canons and, and for our kind of social justice organizing in the present. Um, and we're trying, people are dropping a lot of links, so thank you, but I'll just pose that question to folks. Um, I guess I talk a little bit about, it's been really exciting. I mean, obviously the pandemic is awful, but it has been kind of amazing to present the anthology in this way where we can have lots of digital events with big lineups and hopefully many of them are recorded to be able to bring people together and then like kind of share these readings rather than it being like limited by geography. Um, and when we're thinking about putting together the anthology, we wanted to we wanted to include people from all types of geographies. And so being able to present in this way is kind of amazing, even though it's under duress. <laughs> But I think it will give us something to think about, like if if a return to IRL happens, um, what like what strategies in sharing and presenting and archiving work that's happening like every day? How can we how can we take those learnings like back into the new new world? And just to follow up on the digital archives too, if that's okay. Um, I, I think a, a lot um, about the digital form as something that can be replicated. And so, you know, in to sort of allied the, the instances of um, unevenness and, and by extreme bias and, and principles in the archive based on a collecting model that requires physical objects to then enter into the archive and, and then be digitized. It, you know, there's mo modes and modalities like the post custodial model that requires, you know, imaging and then actually giving the object back to the original owner. So then, you know, the, the provenance isn't the sticking point for what makes something into the, you know, what allows something to enter into the archive. And then it's also, you know, scale like storage isn't no longer an issue besides digital storage, but, you know, that's like a little bit more flexible than trying to, um, you know, store a sign that's 12 feet long or something like that, you can image it and it's the same size as an image of a drawing that's, you know, the size of a postage stamp. So um, that's something that I hope that, I hope archives continuously, you know, move towards that too, as just a way to sort of open things up and, and allow more voices in there. Um, something that there's, 
I love the question about sort of digitalness and adding to transness. Um, something I think about a lot is like the, the subtweet and other aspects of the genre that are like actually really sort of like a big space to move in. And so in part, I think in terms of archiving digital transness, we're reaching a point where people are writing in that space for that space in a way that's also meant to be collected. There's another poem in the anthology, Pink underscore Sissy from Joss Barton, who was a Tumblr contemporary and just writing contemporary friends that I, I like love Joss's work also. And I think Joss really writes in this voice that's both so um, of Tumblr, of like this, our, our mediums and also like has a beginning, has, is, fully occupies that space and has like a beginning and end point in such a way that it's like easy to archive. Um, so sorry to not have a great answer for that question, but I think this book actually does such a good job of archiving these writers who are very digital. Um, and so take time to like expand in the book and see some of these other writers. Yeah, one of, something that I am like so excited about is that there are so many contributors who have said this is their first time being published in print because a lot of them are like either coming from like ultra trans online spaces or just like online journals and stuff. And this is their first time in print. It just feels so special. Um, I was just gonna add a, like a funny complication to thinking through archives and digitality because so Arielle and I uh, have been working with Robert Giard's archive, which is admittedly a visual archive of photography. Um, and, you know, that archive is entirely online through Yale's digital collections archive, which you can search for. Um, and it's how we actually did a lot of our research. Um, but there are also, Giard was also very careful about uh, permissions. So not everyone wanted to be visible through a project that right was identified through LGBTQ lenses. Um, some people uh, were photographed before transitioning. And so our curatorial process in creating the show was to try and reach out to as many people as possible, um, make sure that they wanted this image to be seen. Um, and we had people deny and we actually had to go back to the estate uh, and to people who were reproducing those images online initially um, to basically tell them that we didn't, that the person who uh, is in this image didn't want this image to be reproduced. And so that's just, just something that um, sort of complicates what happens, I think, uh, in certain forms of digital archiving as well. Um, but also the archive is amazing at the same time. So it's, it's complicated, I think. I want to um, get quickly to another question. Uh, I'm scrolling back for it. This was from Ted. Um, where can we hide things for the people we love in the future to find? Um, I think I want to hide it in as many places as possible, um, which is why I appreciate how many genres are represented in this um, and how many places from which it was drawn. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, sneak it in everywhere, do interdisciplinary work. Maybe this is a nice moment to um, drop some more links in the chat and just invite if there's any final thoughts or questions or comments or uh, this has really been like a love fest in so many ways. And I'm really incredibly grateful to Andrea and Kay for bringing this um, anthology into the world for honoring all these writers and for Sasha, Zach, Ellis, 
gains um, everyone for coming and being part of this conversation. And part of what we're trying to do with the One Archives is also think about the, um, the gaps in the record to confront the historical erasure of trans lives and histories. And um, this conversation has been so important and it's being recorded so you can share it with your friends. Um, maybe Andrea put the link one more time. So if you haven't gotten a copy of this book, you will. If you don't have the Lou Sullivan Diaries, um, you can read it in your holiday quarantine. It is absolutely perverted in the best possible way. Um, and maybe we can all unmute and just like clap and people can hang out and stay if they wanna stay and chat and um, really grateful to everyone for showing up today. I, I guess I actually I have one final comment. Is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm not I'm not an archivist, um, and so I'm I'm just like I'm a, I'm a, and I don't really work with archives um, except kind of in one case. Um, but you know, I'm like a poet and whatever. Um, and and I think so. One thing that I'm thinking a lot about right now is like Benjamin writing about the precious but tasteless seeds of revolution. Um, and uh, as, as, as sort of things that are like seeded into like books, among other things, like among other documents, and that are unearthed at, uh, at different moments of like crisis and struggle. Um, and I think that this is relevant, right? It's relevant for somebody like, for somebody like, again, like Leslie Feinberg for like Stone Bridge Blues, which is a book that's largely about shop floor struggles, you know, as much as it's about other, uh, your, your bar being busted up by the pigs. It's also about like solidarity between like men and butches working in factories, right? Um, and that it's important, you know, it's like a book that is a, like has a didactic point. It's about teaching people how not to scab. It's about teaching people what happens when in the middle of like the industrialization, what happened to a lot of people, including queer people. Um, and, and so I think this is this, like, when we think about, you know, the archives, you know, it's not just, and as everybody here, I think, knows kind of intimately, it's not just about like uh, a, a excavating something that's like hot and sexy and fun and weird and historically nerdy. It's actually like teaching each other. I think this goes to Ted's question. Like it's teaching each other outside of a kind of like hegemonic, like fucking like frankly bourgeois or white supremacist, right? Education, teaching each other how life is lived and how transformations happened and how people formed resilient communities against the, the pressures and terrorism of the state and capital. That's very important. Um, uh, so, so, you know, I mean, to a certain extent, the, the, the kind of archival sections, if we had sort of been doing a slightly different project, that could have been much bigger, right? Um, that could have involved a lot more research and we weren't do, really doing that. We wanted to sort of sketch some of those links and put it together with kind of the present work. Um, but there, I think there's more to do here. Um, and I think that that's, so, so it's powerful work, it's important work. I'm really grateful to the people who are really doing it. Um, and I think that there's a real continuity, again, to sort of the things that we're writing um, and, and, and the other ways that we are operating in the present. And uh, yeah, just like, thanks so much to everyone. This is about us. I mean, we really didn't want to do the thing where it was like a bunch of like, you know, 20 to 30 trans people like telling everyone how to have a revolution. We we wanted to connect the dots between like past struggle and how a lot of those struggles are the same or they've shifted and what are those strategies both on the street and on the page or on the stage. We wanted to bring that all together. And um, thank you everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much.